Hello, everybody. Welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. And today, as promised, we're going to be going over all of the different possible transmission line transfer functions. Now, in a previous video on the knee frequency and channel bandwidth, we were discussing how channel bandwidth is defined in terms of a knee frequency for an RC circuit. Now, I said in that video that we're gonna look at transmission line transfer functions, and that's what we're going to do today. This is going to be a long video, but it's gonna be a fun video. So make sure to follow along, grab your notepad and paper, and take notes, because this one is going to be interesting. Let's get started. So to get started, we're looking at transmission line transfer functions. And the reason we're doing this is because when we looked at our previous video on the knee frequency, linked in the description, we found that the knee frequency for a particular channel can be determined by looking at its transfer function. If we're dealing with the knee frequency formula for a transmission line, and we want to determine a knee frequency formula for our specific channel, we need to start by looking at the transfer function for the transmission line. So let's go ahead and dive right in. So if we want to determine a transfer function for a transmission line, in my opinion, the easiest mathematical tool to use is the ABCD parameters. Now in a previous video, I talked about how to convert between S parameters and ABCD parameters. So there is an analogous definition in terms of S parameters, but for now, we're just going to use the ABCD parameters. So I have the definition for the transfer function of a transmission line in terms of the voltage measured at the load and the voltage given from the source in terms of these network parameters. Now these network parameters, the ABCD parameters, are defined in terms of the transmission line impedance and its propagation constant. So we have everything we need here to plug into our transfer function. Now these ZL and ZS terms are the load and the source impedance respectively. So we can kind of plug in anything we want. We could plug in, for example, very low impedance, basically zero. We could plug in, um, let's say, the capacitive termination that we saw in the knee frequency video. We could plug in pretty much any other circuit we want for the load termination. And we're gonna look at all those different examples coming up. Here, what we want to do is determine a relationship between the channel bandwidth, meaning the bandwidth that the channel needs in order to exhibit a particular rise time. So we can determine these different relations. And we did an example of that in the knee frequency video where we got to that classic formula, 0.35 divided by the rise time is equal to the channel bandwidth limit. So here's the process for determining a transfer function, which you can then use to determine the bandwidth rise time relation. So first, pick your source impedance. Obviously, in the circuits we're gonna see coming up, we're gonna have a source impedance that we get to pick. You then need to understand what the model is for your load impedance. So that's actually really important because it depends on the type of component or the packaging that is used to build that component. Then pick your line impedance. Now the line impedance could just be purely resistive 50 ohm, but in real systems, you will actually have some losses that contribute to the line impedance. So it becomes a bit more difficult to calculate those transfer functions. But in our examples, we'll just stick to a real line impedance just to keep things really simple. And then plug in all these different values and then graph the transfer function to see the bandwidth limit. So we are actually going to graph those out and we'll be able to see how things like losses and the characteristics of the load affect the bandwidth limit. So first, let's jump right in. So here what we found when we had this particular model where we had a load capacitance in series with an interconnect with this impedance, we found that the bandwidth rise time relation was 0.35 divided by the rise time. So this is just the knee frequency formula that everyone should be familiar with. And then up here, we have the transfer function in the Laplace domain. And there's a couple of assumptions that are implicit in here. We've also assumed that L equals zero. So essentially we've assumed that this is either a really short transmission line or this alternative case that I've shown here. This is a bit more complex because it requires an additional assumption of a lossless transmission line. So here we're sourcing a voltage from this source and then it reaches this 
uh, load capacitance here at the right side of the screen. This would basically be the capacitive input for a typical integrated circuit. Here, we've just added in a source impedance. We are initially assuming that the source impedance is not necessarily equal to the line impedance, and then the line has some length L. It then reaches a capacitive input on an integrated circuit, and that capacitive input is typically on the order of picofarads. Now here I've drawn this box because here the voltage that you use in this definition for the transfer function, this V sub S, is measured at the output of this little box here. So you can see where my mouse is. It's being measured right here at this point with respect to ground. That voltage is then dropped over this transmission line and this capacitor in this input capacitance model. And so the entire transfer function is up here in the top. So if we assume that we have a low source impedance or Z sub S equal to zero, then this is our transfer function. So this transfer function uses Cauch and Cinch functions in order to describe the propagation. And then you can see here we have our load capacitance and our line impedance. If we just assume that the line is really long, meaning we take L going to infinity, we then have this transfer function. So this transfer function accounts for what could be losses in the transmission line. Now, if we go one step further and we assume that the real part of the propagation constant is zero, meaning that there are no losses, we get right back to this expression for F3dB equals to 0.35 divided by the rise time. So once again, we get back to the knee frequency, and that's because we've eliminated this term up here in the top. That's how we get back to this classic result that we have often quoted that relates transmission line bandwidth or signal bandwidth and signal rise time. Now remember, this equation is just telling you a relationship between the rise time that occurs at this load, so at the load capacitance, and the bandwidth cutoff that occurs in this transfer function for this load. So that's all that this is saying. So what we're gonna see momentarily is that if we accept these losses must exist, and if we have a more complicated termination, we're not actually going to have this result hold anymore. Now, let's suppose that we have the source impedance matched to the transmission line impedance. Does this relation still hold? Well, as it turns out, it actually does, and we don't have to take this limit as the line length goes to infinity. So if I have ZS matching Z0, that means this fraction right here is equal to one, Z0 and ZS are equal, then I can combine these together, use my identity based on the definition of cinch and Cauch functions, and then I get to this transfer function that you see here on this screen. So once again, we're back to the same case that we had in the previous slide, where the standard 3dB versus rise time relation holds if there are no losses. So that's only if there are no losses. This is where we start to see the deviation. So let's look at what happens if instead of just a simple load capacitance, we have actual termination applied here, which is what would actually be the case in high-speed signals, which is where this type of relationship actually starts to matter. If we're dealing with a load capacitance that is then terminated to some target impedance, Z sub T, we would then have this type of transfer function. So first, my load impedance is being modeled as a terminating resistor or a terminating impedance in parallel with a load capacitance. So now my load impedance gets substituted back into the transfer function definition in terms of ABCD parameters. And then here we have this big long transfer function in terms of cinch and Cauch functions. If I set the source impedance equal to the line impedance, then it reduces to this function here that we have on this part of the screen. So you can see here, I still have to deal with line losses, but then I have this other plus one term here in the denominator that will then affect the level of the transmission line function when we start to graph it. So we'll see an example here in just a bit. What if we have a more realistic model for a package? Now, in the previous case, what we assume here is that when the signal encounters the load capacitance, it interacts with the terminating resistance and the load capacitance together because they're essentially close together. The signal does not have to propagate between a load capacitance and then whatever the terminating impedance is. But in a more realistic package model, that might not be the case. 
In a more realistic package model, you could have the load capacitance that sits at the input of the integrated circuit, and then that signal may have to travel over another interconnect, such as a wire as part of a lead frame, or it could have to travel through a package substrate. And so that interconnect is going to have some inductance L associated with it. And then later it could reach a terminating impedance Z sub T. Now there could also be a terminating capacitance in parallel with this terminating impedance. So this other capacitance would be the die capacitance that is seen once the signal travels through the substrate, through the redistribution layer, and then onto the silicon die that's in the package. So this entire set of components that are being used to model this input to a package will also have a great effect on the bandwidth rise time relation. So we aren't going to have the simple case where we saw a CL value here in the denominator anymore. It could actually get much more complex once you start to model a real package. This is just the transfer function without this impedance plugged in here. And so I'm going to leave the plugging in of the impedance of this package model into this equation as an exercise for anybody that's interested in doing some math in their spare time. So I hope you all have fun with that. What we're going to do now is we're going to actually derive some bandwidth rise time relations graphically for one of these situations. So we're going to jump into a graphing calculator online. We're actually going to look at some material parameters for an example system, and then we'll get started. So if we want to look at the effect of losses on the bandwidth limitation imposed on a channel that is terminated with either an arbitrary impedance or terminated just capacitively, what we need to do is define some losses. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at a microstrip example. And in this example, we're going to consider two possible materials. So we're going to consider a DK of about four material and of course, standard loss tangent of 0.02. And we can calculate the uh, dielectric and the conductor losses just using these values. And we can assume a trace width of, let's say about 10 mils. So I've already gone through and calculated some of these values. What we find is that for the dielectric portion, we have 0 0.019 multiplied by the frequency in Hertz and then multiplied by the length in L. And I actually misspoke here. This is not the frequency in Hertz. This is the frequency in gigahertz. So we got to keep that in mind. And then here for the conductor portion, we have 0 0.0181 times square root of frequency in gigahertz, and then multiplied by the length of the line. So next, let's consider an alternative material, something like, let's say, Rogers 3003. This would be DK of about three, and then much lower losses of 0 0.002. Now, in this case, what our dielectric attenuation comes out to is 0 0.0014, and this is again multiplied by the frequency in gigahertz and then the length in inches. And then here we have alpha sub C for our conductor loss. We're gonna keep this the same. So we're essentially assuming that once this DK value has changed, the thickness of the substrate has been adjusted such that the width of the trace remains the same. That's gonna keep our skin resistance constant. And that's going to be 0 0.0181 square root of frequency and then again, multiplied by the length. So next, we need to consider a load capacitance. So our load capacitance, C sub L, is typically going to be anywhere from, let's say, 1 to 10 picofarads. So these are typical values that you will see from data sheets. Also, just as an example, if you ever look at the timing specifications for a spy bus on a component, you'll see it specified in terms of load capacitances. And these are typically the range of load capacitances that you will find called out in the data sheet. So what we will initially do is we'll just assume a somewhat more advanced component that has a one picofarad load capacitance. It's a little low. Typically, you might see that value somewhere around three or four. And then sometimes for the, some uh, physically larger components, you'll see that number get around as high as 10. 
So we might to get to this one if we have time, but we'll definitely look at the one picofarad case initially. We have all of our material parameters that we're gonna use in our example. What we're gonna do next is we're going to create some graphs that allow us to visualize the bandwidth as well as the pulse responses for all of these different possible material combinations and losses. So to get started, we're going to look at two situations here using all these different per material parameters that we wrote down. So first, we're going to look at the case where we have a source impedance, and we're going to match that source impedance to our line impedance. And we're going to check to see whether or not this relation holds once we start to add in these losses. Now, the next thing we'll do after we uh, look at this case without a terminating impedance is we will add in the terminating impedance as we see here. Once we add in that terminating impedance, we'll be able to see how the bandwidth in the transfer function changes. And then from there, we can infer how the rise time will change once we add in this terminating impedance. So to get started, I have uh, a couple of functions graphed here on desmos.com slash calculator. So this is a great online calculator, does graphs really quickly and easily, and I really like using it. So here in the first function that you see right here, uh, we have the transfer function for a line with length L. And so far, it only includes the value that we calculated for the dielectric losses. This is for the DK equals four laminate. So I have these transfer functions for the case with just a source impedance and no terminating resistance here uh, in desmos.com slash calculator. So this is a really great online graphing calculator. It's free to use, and I really enjoy using it to really quickly generate graphs like this. So here in the first row, I have the transfer function for a transmission line with our higher dielectric losses. So this is our DK4 loss tangent of 0.02 laminate. Here we have a length L and we can adjust this length with this slider. Here in the bottom row, we also have a length L for our transmission line, but it's on the lower loss dielectric. So this is DK3.002 dielectric. And then here, this 0.314 in the denominator, this is our C sub L and Z sub zero term that we have right here defined in the transfer function. So here we're keeping the losses and then we wanna see what happens to the transfer function as we allow those losses to steadily increase. Well, first to get started, we need to then add in a feature here and set these as log log graphs. So here we have the standard view for a transfer function for an RC circuit. And you can see here, we have the roll off graphed here for both functions. So both functions are overlapping each other. And if we start to increase the length of the line in inches, we very quickly start to see what happens once we get up to, let's say, a 10-inch line. Once we get up to a 10-inch line, we can see very clearly that the bandwidth of this line starts to decrease pretty significantly. Now, 10 inches is not a huge length here, but you can see here that our bandwidth has decreased, right? It started here at about three gigahertz, and here, our 3 dB bandwidth is down to about 1.5 gigahertz or 1.57 gigahertz. So we see a very clear bandwidth reduction here once we increase this line length out to 10. Now, just for comparison, I'm gonna copy this over here and I'm just gonna eliminate the losses so we can really provide a complete comparison across all these different cases. Now here, when we have no losses, that's the purple curve, we see that the bandwidth is very similar to the low loss case. Now here, the bandwidth at 3 dB is just a little over three gigahertz. So it's about 3.2 gigahertz. A Little bit of loss added in, we start to see that, that bandwidth reduction. Um, and here we've only included the dielectric losses. Now let's include the conductor losses. So the conductor losses are proportional to the square root of the frequency. And I'm going to copy this over to the low loss laminate. So just by adding in the conductor losses to the low loss laminate, we see a pretty severe decrease in the bandwidth. So here we went from 3.2 down to about 1.71. And then here we went even lower on the high loss laminate down to about 1.1 gigahertz. So just to summarize, 
Here we're at 3.2 gigahertz. Here we're at about 1.71 gigahertz. And then here we're at about 1.1 gigahertz. So we see a pretty severe drop off in that bandwidth as we increase the length of the line. Now, obviously, if we start to make this line shorter, these curves start to eventually collapse back on each other, and then they totally overlap when we have a line length of zero, just as we would expect. So now, let's see what happens to the pulse time. We do see a very obvious decrease in the bandwidth. What happens to the pulse response? So I have another set of graphs over here. In this case, I'm only looking at the dielectric losses, and there's a reason for that. The reason for that is because I actually went onto Wolfram to try and calculate the inverse Laplace transform for the case where you have this square root of frequency term in the transfer function, and it actually didn't return a result. So if anyone knows where I can find that result for that inverse Laplace transform, please post it in the comments. Here we're just looking at the case where we have different levels of losses, and this really allows us to see what happens to the pulse time. Interestingly, what we have here is if I start to increase these losses, all that it's doing is it's just shifting one of these curves to the right. And in fact, if you look down here, you can see very clearly that the curves intersect the x-axis at different times. And this is just because we're shifting this curve to the right a little bit. If you actually then calculate the 90% to 10% rise time from these pulse responses, what are you gonna find? You're gonna find that they're actually the same for both curves, even though those curves have different losses associated with them. And that's because the rate of rise here is given by this term in the denominator inside the exponential, this 0.314. So what is this 0.314 term? Well, that is the line impedance multiplied by the load capacitance. That is what is determining, in this case for this model for a load capacitance connected to a transmission line, that's determining what the rise time is of the signal seen at the load. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that in the case where you have higher losses, you no longer have a 0.35 divided by rise time relation anymore for the bandwidth versus rise time you're actually going to have something smaller than 0.35. So if you actually calculate it for this lossy substrate here with a moderately long line length, you're gonna find that it's something like 0.3 or even lower. So that means for your particular channel design, that classic knee frequency formula that's always cited everywhere is actually not going to hold, and it's not going to tell you the correct relationship between the channel bandwidth as limited by the load capacitance and the rate of rise in the signal at that load capacitance. So this is the effect of losses on signals propagating in a transmission line. Now, let's take a look at this more complex model where we have a terminating resistance. So in this case, when we have a terminating resistance, we need to modify the transfer function a little bit. However, we can still compare to the case where we have no losses. So what we need to do is modify each of these graphs. So just for fun, let's assume that we are terminating this impedance here at 40 ohms instead of 50 ohms, just for fun. So if we're terminating at 40 ohms instead of 50 ohms, then Z0 over ZT is 1.2. So what I would do is I would modify each of these functions in the denom denominator, just like this. And I can copy this over to all of the other functions in my graph, and then we can update them, and then we can really see what happens to the bandwidth here. So in this case of this last one, it's being a little stubborn, but if I go ahead and change it, we can then see how it updates, and then we can take a look at the bandwidth. So here we're looking at a drop in the value of the transfer function from about 0.45 to about 0.225. So if I take a look at this value and look at the bandwidth, what happens? Well, here for the lossless case, we see very clearly that we have about 5.75 gigahertz of bandwidth. We have about 2.7, so just a little bit of loss and we've already cut the bandwidth in half. And then here for the lossy case, we've cut it down even further, reduction in about half from that. So it's about 
gigahertz of bandwidth. So once again, we don't have the same type of relation that we had before, where we had to look at the 0.35 divided by T rise value to determine the required bandwidth in the channel. So remember, the channel limits the bandwidth in some way based on the termination that you apply. And we're seeing that very clearly here, but the channel also has limited bandwidth based on the losses in the transmission lines. So we can keep adjusting these values for the losses and the termination to then land on some different curves that tell us how the bandwidth is limited. However, the rise time may continue to be the same depending on the value of these terminations. So how do all of these factors in this model affect the rise time? Well, in this case, I'm gonna leave it up to you as the viewer to simulate that. And you can go ahead and do this in a free spice simulator, or you can use the tools in Altium Designer to do the same type of model. Go ahead and give it a shot, report your results in the comments, and we'll see what everybody thinks. Thanks for watching this very long video, everybody. If you wanna get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation that I was showing on screen earlier, check the link in the description. There is a link where you can download it for free, and you'll have access to all of those different expressions that I showed in the presentation. Also check the other links in the description we have some links to some other blogs and videos that help explain some of these concepts. Last but not least, make sure to leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And of course, hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.